All right, after the longest five minutes of your life, let's stand together. Lift our praises to the Lord. You lived, you died, you said in three days you would rise. You did, you're alive. You rule, you reign, you said you're coming back again. I know that you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. Sing your praises You do, you take our sins away, oh God You give, you gave your life away for us You came Beautiful, joyful day. So many of us here today to celebrate not only worshiping our Lord and Savior, but to celebrate some fellowship after church today uh, with a picnic. I hope all of you know that you're invited for uh, burgers and hot dogs. And if you're at home, you can still make it for burgers and hot dogs after the service today as well. We'd love to have you here. My name is Joel, and I'm the pastor here at St. Mark. And it's just an awesome day to be here worshiping our Lord and receiving the good gifts that he has to offer us in his word today. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to Zoe for our call to worship this morning. Thank you, Zoe. Beautifully played, amazing grace. That was wonderful. We begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yesterday, my oldest son, Jonah, uh, participated in his Little League championship game. It was an exciting game, uh, a lot of back and forth, uh, and they lost the game. 
Very sad. Kids were a little bit bummed. But I couldn't be more proud because about halfway through the second inning, all the players stopped, uh, all the coaches stopped, and we all lined up along the third and the first baseline, and an award was giving out, given out for sportsmanship. And the coach from our team went on and on about how one player played catcher the entire season, even though he did not like playing catcher at all. And the coach didn't even know it because he never complained, he never whined, he just always did his best. And he called up my son Jonah to get the Sportsmanship Award. I have to brag on him because I'm a very proud father. But I got to thinking a little bit about how it's kind of like our life. I think too often we like to play to win or lose, right? In our relationships, we always are trying to win and get ahead of other people, and, and maybe we shame them when they, they hurt us or we insult them when they make us feel bad. Or We're trying to win or lose in the game of our career or, or the th- kind of things we have or how we feel about ourselves. We want to be winners, and we, we don't feel good about being losers. When in reality, I think God, our Heavenly Father, all he really cares about is how we're loving each other. What kind of teammates we're being to our our family members, our kids, our parents, our neighbors. How we're expressing the love of Jesus and instead of whining and complaining about the state of the world or the the state of our finances or the state of our health, and we say, Lord, everything we have belongs to you. We just want to love, to serve, and to give. So as we enter into God's presence today, let us confess of our need to always win and our shame in losing, and realize that in Christ Jesus, we've already won the greatest victory, and that is life forever with him. And all that matters now is loving and serving and giving away, knowing that our home is secure in heaven. So let's confess those things together this morning and receive that good news from Jesus himself. Gracious and merciful God, we confess to you our disobedience when temptation enters our lives. We put worldly values before our desire for you. Our hunger for power and wealth is greater than our hunger for seeking and doing your will. We use the gifts you give us to benefit ourselves at the expense of serving others. We bribe and manipulate to influence and control people instead of humbly loving as you have loved us. We treat you as though you owe us everything instead of letting your grace in Christ Jesus be sufficient in us. Forgive us, O God, and increase our trust in you. Give us the wisdom and power of your Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Speak to us your words of eternal life and help us to take up our crosses daily and follow you. Our Heavenly Father has had mercy on you. In Jesus Christ, he sees you as his precious child, and he's proud of you, and he so desires you to know his grace and his mercy each and every day of your life. As a call and ordained servant of Jesus, and by his power, by his authority, and by his command, I declare your sins and mine are completely forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture reading for today is from Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 31. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, 
one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it, it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus said, told them, for it, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. This is the word of the Lord. Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise as we share in our common confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. He descended into hell. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, as we contemplate today on your last meal with your disciples, we are so profoundly grateful for all that you went through in order to win forgiveness for us and the entire world. Lord, as we hear from your word today, may our hearts be open and our minds enlivened to see you for who you truly are and how you come to us with your grace and mercy every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've been to St. Mark for any length of time, or if you've been a Lutheran for a while, maybe your entire life, even if you've been to a Christian church, you've probably noticed that we as Christians have quite an affinity for the sacrament of the altar, for Holy Communion, for the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the wafer and the wine, whatever you want to call it. Whatever you want to call it, it really is special. It's a gift. It's far too special that even though we celebrate it weekly, we don't pause nearly enough to think about the profoundness of what Jesus offers to us in this meal. Its meaning, its power, or even its great historic origin. So today in our reading from Mark chapter 14, we looked and we saw and we heard Jesus institute it for the first time. So let's take a look at Jesus' last meal with his disciples, the details that surrounded it, and what it means for us today. First, we have to step back into time. What was the Passover? For those of you who, who don't know, the Passover was this holy annual festival for God's people, the Israelites. It was about 1,500 years before Jesus was even born. The Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. They had gotten there due to a famine in the land, and they had gone to Egypt where Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob, had, had risen up in the ranks and had prepared for the famine by collecting food and grain to feed thousands, millions of people for years and years. It was a gift of God. Before that, God had promised Abraham that he was going to bless him 
Abraham, this pagan shepherd from nowhere, that he was going to make him a great nation, even though Abraham was very old in age, that he was going to, to count the number of stars in the sky. That was going to be the amount of descendants that he would have. Not only that, but that they would get a land to call their own. And finally, by Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And sure enough, now Abraham had his son Isaac. Isaac had his son Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Israel had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And for about 400 years now, they had lived in Egypt, and they had multiplied greatly. God's promise to Abraham had come true. Scholars generally agree that perhaps about a million Israelites lived in Egypt around that time. In fact, they were growing and multiplying so rapidly that God was blessing them that the Pharaoh at the time had forgotten about God and and what he had done through Joseph, and he started to see the Israelites as a threat. And so he began to persecute them. He said if they they continue to grow in number, they could revolt, and we could have a full-blown civil war on our hands. So he enslaved the Israelites. He forced them into slave labor, making bricks of mud and straw in the heat of the summer sun. He began to kill all the first, all the the males that were born to the Israelite people and force the women to marry Egyptians so that basically the Israelites would be assimilated and wiped out as a culture. The Israelites called out to God for, for freedom, for rescue, for salvation, and God heard their prayers. He used Moses, uh, an Israelite boy, uh, born and then grew up in the house of Pharaoh. And, and then consequently, he had, had run off into the desert. God called Moses, you're going to be the one to go to Pharaoh and cause him to let my people go. So we all know what happened, right? God, through Moses, sent plagues upon Egypt. Moses went to Pharaoh and said, God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, not going to do it. No way, not going to let you go. He sent plague after plague, nine of them from from boils on the skin to bugs to to the Nile River turning to blood, darkness to frogs uh, manifesting themselves and hopping into people's beds where they slept. It was horrible. But each and every time, Pharaoh still said, no, I'm not going to let you go until the final plague. God said that I'm going to send the angel of death and all firstborn males in each household, they're going to die. And so it, it came to pass. But it's just as God had protected the Israelites from all the first nine plagues, he also promised to protect them from this last plague as well. He gave them the instruction to take a lamb, one year old, without blemish, to take that lamb, each family, into their home for four full days. And at the end of the fourth day, to sacrifice that lamb, to take the blood of the lamb and to paint it on the doorposts of their homes. And once they did that, when the angel of death came, he would pass over the home that was marked with the blood of the lamb. And everyone within that home would be saved. That's where we get the word Passover from. The angel of death would pass over those homes. And that's how it happened. The Israelites were spared. Pharaoh finally told them to leave. And eventually, they reached the fulfillment of God's second promise to Abraham. They got to the promised land. It took them a little bit to get there, but they got there. They got a land, this beautiful little stretch of land on the east side of the Mediterranean. And so beginning with that first Passover, God gave the Israelites instructions that every single year they were to celebrate this Passover together. It was to be to them their national independence day, if you will. And they would have these special foods that they would eat. They would eat the lamb that was sacrificed uh, and roasted over a fire. They would eat bitter herbs, horseradish, and other uh, leafy lettuces dipped in salt water to remind them of the bitter tears that their people cried in slavery in Egypt. They ate haroseth, which was this mixture of nuts and fruits and wine in order to remind them of the bricks that they made with their hands and the brutal uh, labor that they endured. They ate matzah bread, unleavened bread, which did not have yeast in it. Wasn't, did, they didn't have time to let the bread rise. They had to eat it in haste. They, have, they had this beautiful meal that was all prepared for them, the lamb. And then they had the four cups of wine, wine which was given as, as something that kings drink, as nobility drinks, not that slaves drink. 
For them, every single time, for generations, for thousands of years, families gathered together. They dressed themselves in clothes, ready to make a run for it, as if what happened to their ancestors were happening to them as well. It was their national identity. It was their story, their narrative of how God had had grace and mercy, how he had shown his power for them, his people. The youngest in the family during that night would prepare for weeks to to play his part in the role of the meal. Why on this night do we eat these special foods? What makes this night so different than all other nights, the child would ask. And the story would be told, and it would come to life again and again. Each gathering, they would place themselves back in that setting as God's people. It was the greatest narrative of mercy and grace and the love of God. And every person that was living within 15 miles of Jerusalem was required by law to head to Jerusalem for the Passover meal. In fact, at that time, Jerusalem, which typically had a citizenship of about 100,000 people, would, by all scholars' uh, understanding, swell to maybe 2 to 3 million people at the time that Jesus was celebrating the Passover. And it's exactly for that reason For these reasons together that Jesus chose this night to start a new narrative, to finish God's promise to Abraham 1,500 years ago, that yes, they would be a people, yes, they would have a land, but now by Abraham's offspring, by Jesus Christ himself, all nations of the world would be blessed. So on this Passover, this last Passover of Jesus, he places himself in the very center of the story. Jesus becomes the perfect lamb that would be sacrificed not only for the the nation of Israel, but for the sins of all people in all times and in all places. As John the Baptist cried out when he first saw Jesus three years before, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's why Jesus came. He became the new Passover, that all who believe in what Jesus did on the cross and in the empty tomb, that death would not be the end of their story. That just as Jesus rose from the dead, all who put their faith and trust in Christ, we would rise too and spend an eternity with God forever in paradise. That's why we don't celebrate the Passover anymore. I mean, we can to remember what God did for his people, but we celebrate a new Passover. We celebrate Christ's Passover. This meal we call the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, something that Jesus gives us on that night to remember what he has done on the cross for us and for all people. It's the new holiest festival in history, one that billions of believers celebrate on this day and every week all around the world from every different nation and language. So what can we learn about this special meal? about the Lord's Supper from Jesus' time with his disciples in Mark chapter 14. Three things, I think, stand out uh, to me in this passage and for us. The first is that in the Lord's Supper, Jesus promises to be present with us. Mysteriously, miraculously, yet physically being with us. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus took that bread and he said, This bread is my body. He took the cup and he said, this cup is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for many. I think there's a reason that, that when God prescribed the Passover, he had the Israelites keep that lamb for four days. You think you know what it, what it is? Why would he, he have them keep that lamb in their home for four days? They grew to love that lamb. That lamb became a pet for them. Some of you, he wanted them to to know and to experience that the love for that lamb and then also to feel the pain of that lamb that would have to be sacrificed in order for them to go free. Some of you know that we have guinea pigs uh, at our home. And if you don't know the story of how we got guinea pigs, basically my wife said we're getting guinea pigs and I didn't have a a really much of a say in the matter. It was for the education for the children, you know, and to, to help them learn how to care for small creatures. And I said, okay, we can get guinea pigs, but but you guys, you're going to clean, you're going to feed them, you're going to take care of them, and I'm just going to look at them from now and again. 
But after a few days went by, a few weeks went by, it was clear that I was the one who was going to become most attached to the guinea pigs. I feed the guinea pigs better than I feed my own children. That's me dishing up a beautiful salad of kale and carrots and cucumbers and peppers to the guinea pigs. In fact, every time I walk into the room where they are, they start screaming for joy that I'm there begging for their next delicious meal. See, the more time I spent with them, the more I got to love them and care for them. And I think that's why God had the Israelites take that lamb. And that's what Jesus does in the Lord's Supper to us, too. He wants us to spend time with him in community with one another. As we gather together, we hear his words each and every week. He wants us to spend time with him because he locates himself in this worship meal where he actually tangibly, literally gives himself to us week after week. He promises to be present with us. And it's not just in the bread and the wine, but when we come together and we sing, and we pray, and we hear his word, and we encourage one another, and when we fellowship together, he literally inhabits the praises of his people. God is not somewhere far off and distant from us, but he locates himself with us here today, tangibly in the bread and the wine, and each word that is spoken. As different as we all are, we're united by the love of our Savior as we each eat and drink of his very presence for us. And the more time we spend with him and with each other, the more we come to love him and to discover the depths of his love and his grace for us. And you thought it was just a snack meant to hold us over till lunch, right? No, it's a profound, beautiful meal of God's presence with us. The second thing we learn about the Lord's Supper is that in this special meal, Jesus forgives our sins. We learn that in this meal that Jesus continues to do that, that our life, our faith, our salvation are from beginning to end completely dependent on him. Sometimes Christians have this temptation to think that, that when Jesus saves us and gives us faith, then, then it's up to us, right, to prove that we've really received that gift worthily. And so we, we try to be better people, and we, we try to come to church as often as we can, and we want to prove to God that we're doing something with this salvation that he's given to us. But it's clear in the details around Jesus' final days that Jesus does the saving and the blessing and the working for our salvation from beginning to end. First, he sets everything up in secret. Did you notice that? The disciples say, Where, what can we do to go prepare for the Passover? And Jesus is basically like, I've already done it all. Uh, you're going to go find a, a man who's carrying a jug of water, which, you know, this is kind of how it worked back there. Men never carried jugs of water. That was the women's job, right? So it had been profoundly odd and weird to, to have a man carry water. Jesus had, had orchestrated this whole thing from the very beginning. Why? So they couldn't mess it up. He knew they probably would mess it up. So he had to do it all for them. To the fact that, that he had Judas betray him, not there in the upper room. He kept that a secret. But after he had, had finished the meal with his disciples and he went out into the garden, he told Judas, now go and do what you must do. You see, Jesus knew that if, if Judas had portrayed him at that last meal and they had come to capture Jesus there in the heart of the city, Jesus, who was profoundly popular at that time, there would have been a riot. They would have grabbed Jesus and tucked him away. He wouldn't have been able to accomplish his death on the cross. But no, he waited until afterwards he could go outside the city. They could take him in secret so that he could actually be sacrificed on Passover himself. He even orchestrated the very day that it was going to happen. The, the religious leaders, they didn't want to sacrifice him during the Passover. Why? Because there were millions of people in the city who would see it, who would hear about it, who would question it. But that's exactly why Jesus did it at that time. He wanted them to take this message back out from everywhere that they had gathered, back to their hometowns, to wonder about it, to talk about it, to, to proclaim what they had seen in Jesus the Messiah crucified and then his empty tomb. See, even in our lives as believers, we constantly prove that we're incapable of per perfect obedience to God. We're incapable of, of making ourselves so good that we're worthy on our own for Jesus. In fact, the best video I've seen to describe the Christian life is this one right here. I hope I don't see it here. Is it there? <laughs> Ah. 
этой стороны, против солнца. Right? Jesus saves us. <laughs> he gives us faith. He gives us new life. And we're like, thanks, Jesus. And what's on to the next sin, you know? We can do it on our own. No, we can't. We just dig ourselves another new hole. And we continue to do this over and over and over again. That's my life in a 30-second clip right there. When we come to the Lord's Supper, Jesus is not under any uh, understanding that we're coming and, and bringing our best to him. In the Lord's Supper, he offers us forgiveness. We come to him empty. We come to him like Judas and Peter and the disciples who betray him and deny him constantly in our thoughts, in our words, in our, our actions. And yet, he, just like he did for them, he freely offers us this special meal, his forgiveness, his love, his promise that what he did on the cross, he gives to us each and every week. And the very fact that we come to receive it is because Jesus, as the good shepherd, has drawn us out again and again and brought us back to himself. We come to him empty and we leave filled with his presence, with his power, with his strength, with his love for others, with his spirit, and to walk with him in the week ahead. So the Lord's Supper helps us to remain dependent on him for everything. Let's not watch it again. Finally, in the Lord's Supper, Jesus fills us with This meal is an appetizer of a much better, a much fuller, a much more fulfilling meal that is coming when Jesus returns. At the end of the passage, Jesus says to his disciples, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And they were. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And despite the fact that they said, Lord, we'll never leave you or abandon you, Jesus knew that they would run away in fear, and they did. They went back to Galilee, where they were from, instead of waiting in Jerusalem for him to rise again like he said that he would. He knew that they'd lose all hope, that they'd go back home, and yet he promised to go ahead of them and meet them in Galilee, a statement of fact that he was going to go to them even after they lost hope. You see, in the same way, I think we are all prone to lose hope in this life whether it's a setback in our health, every time there's a broken relationship in our life, a financial insecurity, a sin that cripples our joy, whenever there's a troubling event in the world and things seem scary, a a pandemic, whatever circumstances there are, it's easy for us to lose hope. But you see, the reality is that in this meal, Jesus gives us the same promise that he gave his disciples. I'm going ahead of you. I'm going ahead of you into heaven to prepare a place for you so that no matter whatever the circumstances in your life or in this world, you always have hope because I'm coming back. The Apostle Paul says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a statement of hope when we eat the body and the blood of Jesus that he is coming again. And then all health will be restored. All relationships will be reconciled. The world will be under the full authority of Jesus. There will be no more sin, no more death. We will even be reunited with those that we've lost in a life that will never end. There's hope in the Lord's Supper. Now, there's a lot more we could say about the Lord's Supper, but I think that's good enough for today. We're all hungry. We're going to share in this wonderful fellowship meal together of God's body and blood, and then in fellowship together. But I pray that as you receive this gift of God's grace, his presence, and his forgiveness, that he would assure you that your sins indeed are forgiven, that he is with you always. Amen. I invite you now to rise as we pray together the prayers of God's people. O oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we praise you and glorify your name. We thank you, Papa, for your word and the clarity it brings to your will for our lives and the body of our church, St. Mark. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would continue to cover us and provide us the courage and strength to live your will, both individually and as your body of St. Mark. We thank you for your written word. O oh, Papa, we pray for the awareness for the many ways we are blessed by the gifts through the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, we trust you that, so that we have the courage and to follow your gifts, to follow our gifts. 
Please let us see in each other these blessings and encourage each other to explore how we might use them so that we may glorify you. Father, you sent your son to live, teach, and suffer, eventually being turned over to those who would crucify him so that through his blood shed on the foot of the cross, his death would save us from our sins, bring us to eternal life. With this mystery of the Holy Spirit, we pray for strength in the truth that Jesus is the good news. We ask for the wisdom and logic to share the truth of Jesus Christ with love to non-believers and skeptics, that they may become one with you, Jesus Christ. O oh, Papa, we come to you with humble prayers for our children, for your children, our brothers and sisters who are sick and injured. We ask in Jesus' name for complete healing and restoration. We know your love is far greater than our understanding. We lift our hands to you, Lord, with all the faith that we have, that your healing hand will rest on those names we each hold on our hearts. Lord, we pray with gratitude for the positive results in the treatment and battle against COVID virus, remembering all those who lost the fight from COVID, and for their families, we pray to you, Jesus Christ, for comfort and healing. We pray for all those who have worked long and hard hours serving the affected community with a with, without their tireless efforts and inconvenience of being separated from their own families, we would not be able to make this progress. We thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. Come, for the table is prepared. Our Lord Jesus comes to give you his gift of forgiveness, his presence, and the hope of eternal life. You may be seated. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God. Hallelujah. Sing with all the peace of God and join in the hymn of all creation, blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. For the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Oh, alleluia, alleluia.
Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. Stand and exalt him together. Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated for just a few announcements. Good morning. This is our last preschool update for church for the school year, and I am so surprised that we're already at the end of this amazing year. Today I want to update you on a couple of things that we've done in the last month. First of all was our art show and auction that you all helped us with tremendously, and we were able to raise $4,000, and it was also amazing to see the families on school. They got to um, you know, see each other, socialize, and then see all the hard work that their children have been doing. Secondly, we did celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week at the end of May, and that was amazing to see um, my teachers' dedication and hard work. So appreciated. They got coffee, flowers, lunch, and gifts. And lastly, we celebrated our pre-K class of 2021. They are heading off to kindergarten. We had 20 students uh, graduate from our program, and another beautiful evening with the families all here and the kids sang songs and it was just a, a lovely um, way to end the school year and that is all I have for you thank you very much St. Mark's annual vacation Bible school is fast approaching the week of August 2nd through August 6th is God calling you to step in and help with VBS this year perhaps putting together decorations from home or leading children to stations during VBS week? Please contact Kristen Beyer to let us know if you're available to help. Registration will take place after volunteers are recruited. We're looking forward to the St. Mark kids finally having the Vacation Bible School they missed out on last summer. This year's theme is Rocky Railway. Jesus' power pulls us through. We are saddened to inform you that our beloved sister and longtime member Lori Cook went home to be with the Lord on Wednesday, May 26th. Her faith, love, and service will continue to leave a lasting impact on the lives she's touched. A memorial service will be held Saturday, June 26th at 2 p.m. at St. Mark Lutheran Church. Thank you to everyone for your outpouring of love and prayers. More information can be found in the St. Mark e-news. We have a webinar coming up, Cybersecurity, Identity Theft, and Safeguarding Your Home. 
hosted by Thrivent, and it will be held on Tuesday, June 22nd at noon and also at 6.30 p.m. online. Jeff Lanza, an FBI agent for over 20 years, brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to this discussion. This dynamic presentation will focus on how to keep our homes safe from intruders and how criminals try to trick us, steal our identity, and commit cyber intrusions. We'd love to have you join us. For more information, contact Jess Remnitz. And his information can also be found in the St. Mark in Action newsletter. This is Paula signing out. Stick around for the church picnic. Have fun and have a wonderful week. Thank you, Paula. Uh, before we head back to the back, I'd like to uh, recognize and thank those who helped make a uh, beautiful presentation and lunch for us. Uh, so if you've helped out, would you please stand? Um, I know Allie's in the back, Dave, Paul and Carolyn and Kuttner, uh, Randy and his family. Let's give them a round of applause, Carol. <laughs> Ashra. I think a lot of the helpers are still back there setting up. So if you, if you see them, give them a, a big thank you uh, for all the hard work they put into this amazing lunch. Peg and a number of others, too. Uh, so let's uh, stand, and we'll join together in a prayer for the, for the food. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for today and the time that we have together as brothers and sisters in Christ to celebrate summer, to celebrate uh, the return to church, to celebrate all the amazing, amazing things you've done in our community. And we pray uh, thanksgiving for the food that we're about to share together and all the, the wonderful conversations that are going to take place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll see you in the back.